What is on your radar today, Robbie? Well, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are likely to add the COVID-19 vaccine to the immunization schedule for children and adolescents. As we discussed on the show yesterday, an advisory panel has voted unanimously to recommend the COVID-19 vaccines for all Americans ages six months and older. And the full agency is almost certain to sign off on this decision. We don't expect any pushback there. Now, such a move would not automatically make the vaccines mandatory for children. In theory, CDC guidance is optional in theory. In practice, many municipalities will be inclined to require whatever the CDC recommends. We know that during the pandemic, cities and states controlled by Democratic political figures frequently rubber-stamped federal health officials' extremely cautious coronavirus recommendations relating to masks, social distancing, lockdowns, etc. Blue, blue municipalities took their cues from their local health departments, which in turn copied the CDC's guidance wholesale into formal policy. When frustrated, caution-weary constituents would ask their local officials about timelines for getting rid of mass mandates and reopening schools, their answer was usually something like, when the CDC says so, that's when we'll do it. Okay, this means that adding the COVID-19 vaccine to the childhood immuni immunization schedule will create a tremendous incentive for blue states to require it for public school children. And look, this would be a profound mistake. There's no way around it. In general, the rationale for vaccine mandates is public health. Public school children are required to get vaccinated for measles, for instance, in order to prevent the spread of measles to other more vulnerable individuals. This same logic, unfortunately, does not hold for the COVID-19 vaccines, which have largely failed to prevent the spread of infection, particularly for the COVID-19 variants. The vaccines do a tremendous job of preventing elderly and at-risk people from suffering severe illness and dying. But most children are fortunately spared the worst effects of COVID-19 anyway, particularly if they were already infected, which is now the case for nearly nine out of every 10 kids, according to the CDC. Some European countries have looked at the data, the same data, and determined that, well, there isn't enough net benefit to merit childhood vaccination. Denmark, for instance, is no longer recommending COVID-19 vaccines for otherwise healthy young people under the age of 18. This is not because Denmark's government was overtaken by right-wing anti-vaxxers, but rather because there are reasonable arguments both for and against the policy. Thus, leaving the matter to individual families and their doctors is the best thing to do. Indeed, even in the U.S., less than 40% of kids under the age of 11 have received the vaccine. Most parents have evidently decided that this course of action is not strictly necessary for their children. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. Requiring children to get the COVID-19 vaccine could, on the other hand, create several problems. Parents who are disinclined to give their children the COVID-19 vaccine, they might start to wonder whether the other vaccines on the childhood immunization schedule are similarly unnecessary, which could have dire results for public health in terms of measles and other things. Unvaccinated children might simply end up dropping out of school or being forced out of school, which would worsen the pandemic-driven crisis of learning loss. Low-income students and students of color will be hardest hit. Attempts by Washington, D.C. to require public school children to get jabbed were delayed after it became clear that a disproportionate number of unvaccinated black and brown young people would be banned from school under just such a policy. If, quote, if mandates become the norm, unvaccinated children will be displaced to virtual school, homeschool, or perhaps no school at all, writes Vinay Prasad, a health researcher and professor of epidemiology at the University of California, San Francisco. We've had him on the show before. He's probably familiar to much of the audience. He says the harm to kids from substandard education after nearly two years of disruption far exceeds any gains from compliance. Some states have already signaled that they will not require the COVID-19 vaccine of school children, even if the CDC does schedule it. Quote, states determine their own immunization schedule and Tennessee's will not be changing, a spokesperson for Tennessee's governor told the press. Given the reality of COVID-19, that most children already have some protection from it and getting vaccinated does not substantially prevent outbreaks of it, well, that's just the right move. Let individual families talk to their doctors about vaccinating their children, make the decision on a case-by-case -case basis. The government does not have a legitimate rationale for butting in, and if it does so, you're going to end up with a lot of kids kept out of school, and it's going to make the crisis we're going through in terms of reading scores, math scores. There was new data on that yesterday that we discussed a little bit on the show. It's going to get worse. Don't do it. So I think this is, uh, 
this is a big concern. The mm -hmm. more I've, I've looked into this, um, the more it seems to me quite likely that this will be, not because the CDC adding this to the schedule de facto causes um, a, a mandate, but because I suspect it will in practice result in a lot of mandates. And I am deeply, I'm very concerned about that. I, I, I think it's, it's hard to say that, it, it seems very clear to me that the effects of that will be worse. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, we can't predict, but I am struck by the fact that so many blue states like New York seem to have gone above and beyond, much to the chagrin of many, um, you know, some doctors, medical practitioners, public health experts, to say it's absolutely okay not to mask. You know, you remember the brouhaha over the signs that um, Kathy Holchel put up in the subway that said, like, this, this, or this are all fine ways to wear a mask, you know, mm -hmm. implying that it's okay, you know, it's a public, a, a, a good public health choice not to wear one as opposed to just staying neutral and out of it. Um, so it does seem to me that it might be the case that even the blue states recognize that this is like a losing political issue and have backed off of even just blindly following the CDC's recommendations. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see. But what I'm curious about is substantively, if this if the recommendations of the advice is largely tethered to whether or not the, the idea that kids who have already had COVID, which is the majority of kids, right. have antibodies that offer them some degree of protection that makes the um, the shots moot, the vaccines moot, how long do we know that these antibodies are going to last? And does that mean that eventually people are going to get need to get another shot? Or this, or this is just this expectation that they're going to get reinfected. And if the expectation is that everyone just serially gets reinfected or serially gets shots either way, when are we going to get better data about what the effects of those two different outcomes mm -hmm. are relative to each other? Because that should determine what the public policy response is. Right. But that's not in the, the current, what the, what the advisory panel right considered has nothing to do. It didn't consider, it wasn't considering one versus the other. It was just saying there should be, uh, you know, if you're older than six months, you should get the vaccine, and then you should get a booster. And I, I don't know that it goes much beyond that. Yeah, the, um, I mean, the other question, and this is what I talked to with uh, Dr. Prasad when he came on, on my podcast, you know, he also made the argument about antibodies offering protection. And when I asked him about, well, what happens when the antibodies wear off, he said, well, we don't really know when that happens. And we'll know when we start mm -hmm. to see another spike in hospitalizations and deaths. And at that point, we can reevaluate, which, again, doesn't sound so great if you're the person who's dying or hospitalized sure. as the test case. But I, I appreciate that response. But the other aspect of it is how much do you wait long COVID? How much is long COVID going to be a concern? And does it matter if the vaccines also aren't proven to limit or, or to reduce the incidence of long COVID? Those are the kind of questions that need to be asked by these medical right. practitioners before they can really, I think, credibly impose uh, vaccine mandates mm -hmm. uh, on kids. Or cr credibly put it alongside vaccines that are really important to get for public health reasons. And I, I worry they'll erode confidence. And, and now it's just you, they're, they're polluting that list almost yeah. by adding something that they don't have as much data on to, to suggest it's absolutely necessary for this age group over time. We, we just don't know yet, as yeah. you said. But we, we do know those other things are really important to get. You should absolutely get them. Yeah. And they serve a public health benefit, not just a because they do limit the spread of those diseases. Yeah. And now I, I, and there might be some, some people might take a second look at that. That'd be very bad if they did. Yeah. But that's what yeah. I'm worried about. We'll have more rising right after this. Stay with us.